Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, Clemson students, faculty, staff, and friends. My name is Andrew Boyles, and I'm a senior political science major and Lyceum scholar here at Clemson University. I'd like to welcome you to this evening's event on behalf of the Clemson Institute for the Study of Capitalism and its Lyceum program, headed by its executive director, Dr. C. Bradley Thompson. This event was made possible with generous support from the Jack Miller Center, which seeks to reinvigorate American civic education and promote an understanding of America's founding principles and history. Tonight, I am honored to introduce Dr. Michael Zucker, our guest lecturer for the evening. Dr. Zucker is the Nancy R. Drow Professor of Political Science Emeritus at the University of Notre Dame, where he taught for 21 years. He has also taught at other universities throughout the country, including Arizona State University, Cornell University, and the University of Michigan. Dr. Zucker has written extensively in the areas of political theory, constitutional studies, and American political thought. In addition to a multitude of academic articles, he has published numerous books, such as Natural Rights and the New Republicanism, The Natural Rights Republic, Launching Liberalism, and, with Catherine Zucker, The Truth About Leo Strauss. Dr. Zucker has edited numerous other books and articles and is the founding editor of American Political Thought, a journal of ideas, institutions, and culture. He earned his Bachelor of Arts degree from Cornell University and his Master of Arts and PhD from the University of Chicago. Tonight, he will help us understand slavery and the Constitution. So now, please join me in giving a warm Clemson welcome to our distinguished guest speaker, Dr. Michael Zucker. Thank you very much. Thank you. I must say I'm a little daunted by this room. Uh, I'm a, I, I didn't expect it to get quite this full, but I'm pleased to see you all here. And this is my first visit to Clemson, and uh, it's a very nice welcome. So thank you very much, and I hope you'll find this worth your time coming out as well. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, my topic is slavery and the Constitution. And if you have been awake or woke, probably you realize that this is a very controversial topic these days. The present controversy was set off about three years ago when the New York Times published something they called the 1619 Project. This was a series of essays raising the claim that 1619, the year that the first slaves arrived in America, was the most significant date in American history because these articles claimed that the, the his, that history, American history, has centered on and been shaped by the fact and experience of American slavery. And that, uh, uh, that America has been chiefly characterized by racism. Those are the claims of the 1619 Project. This claim was by no means universally accepted at that time or since, and many voices rose to claim 1776, the year of the American Revolution, and the Declaration of Independence as the true date that pointed to the meaning of America and committed to rights, liberty, and equality. The debate then sent, set in motion was actually the continuation of an ongoing conflict between two groups of historians. One group I'm calling Neo-Garrisonians, named for the famous 19th century abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison, and the other group, Neo-Lincolnians, named for the famous 19th century president, Abraham Lincoln. Now, one aspect of that ongoing debate concerned the Constitution. The Garris, James, uh, Garrison himself, the abolitionist, called the Constitution, famous quotation, a covenant with death and an agreement with hell because of its support for the institution of slavery. Lincoln, on the other hand, said, don't interfere with anything in the Constitution. That must be maintained, for it is the only safeguard of our liberties. As you can see, two very different perspectives on the Constitution. Now, I cannot here give you in detail the various debates over slavery and the Constitution between these two groups of historians, but I think a brief summary of it will be useful to you. 
The debates concern two issues in the main. First, how favorable was the Constitution to slavery? And second, what were the motives upon which the founding generation acted? The Neo-Garrisonians answered that first set of questions rather straightforwardly. The Constitution was very favorable to the institution of slavery and gave it a great deal of life-sustaining aid. The Neo-Lincolnians, however, while conceding that the Constitution did indeed make some accommodations to slavery, deny that these were nearly as substantial as the Neo-Garrisonians claim. The Neo-Garrisonians answer the second set of questions by arguing that the founders were moved by the same complex of motives that led to the establishment and flourishing of the institution of slavery in the first place. Greed, racism, um, sorry, <laughs> Christian triumphalism and moral indifference. Uh, the Neil Lincolnians argue, on the other hand, that the place of slavery in the constitutional order was due primarily to the press of necessity, that the union would not have been possible to have been made and completed if some concessions to slavery had not been made. The Neo-Lincolnians frequently point to the expectation, or at least hope, among the founders that the process of abolition in the states, which began during and after the revolution, would continue until slavery was removed from the land. As Lincoln himself put it, the founders lived in the expectation of the ultimate extinction of slavery. Now these scholarly debates on slavery can be very heated the topic is so controversial, in fact, that partisans of the different positions cannot even degree, agree about how many parts of the Constitution are indeed relevant to slavery. One Neo-Garrisonian I know found in the Constitution 18, count them, 18 clauses supported of, supportive of slavery. The Neo-Lincolnians find far fewer, only three. And I'll just mention them, but the, the three-fifths formula for representation and taxation, the slave trade clause, and the fugitive slave clause, those three. One leading Neo-Garrisonian distinguishes between direct and indirect aids to slavery in the Constitution. In the former group, he would include, for example, the fugitive slave clause, about which I'm going to speak a little more later, um, which protected slave owners from losing runaways who made it into free states. An example of the latter, an indirect aid, would be the insurrection clause, which empowered the federal government to come to the aid of any state suffering an insurrection, which could include a slave insurrection. This classification, I think, is actually useful and helpful, but I would add to it a distinction between clauses in the Constitution specifically tailored to accommodate the presence of slavery in the country and provisions that most likely would have been in the Constitution even if there were no enslaved persons on the entire American continent. The Insurrection Clause, I believe, is an example of the latter because this idea was a staple of the theory of federal unions during the founding era that this was one of the advantages of federal systems, that they could come to the aid of each other in that way. Many, if not all, of the indirect aids to slavery are of this kind. Now, on the preliminary question of how many parts of the Constitution bear on slavery, we need to be more refined, I think, than the Neo-Garrisonians often are. To say that various provisions of the Constitution might aid slavery, directly or indirectly, does not establish that aiding slavery was the aim or the expected long-term consequence of the constitutional order. It would be perfectly compatible with the Neo-Garrisonian indirect aids for the founders to have aimed at and expected to see slavery undone 
in the medium range future. More generally, I would say, neutral provisions in the Constitution and indirect aids may prove to be protective of slavery, but this true observation, I believe, proves too much. The Constitution as a whole, if successful in providing peace, security, stability, prosperity, would tend to provide support for any and all practices and institutions that were part of the established status quo in the states. Thus, we could increase the neo-Garrisonian tally substantially if we used the test of aid uh, to, uh, to include everything in the Constitution. The neo-Garrisonians also do not credit sufficiently the refusal of the text's drafters to include the words slavery and slave in it because it was something they considered blameworthy and a blemish that they hoped would be removed. James Madison, the chief draftsman, not draftsman really, but the chief inspiration for the Constitution, James Madison said at the Constitutional Convention that he thought, he said, he thought it wrong to admit in the Constitution the idea that there could be property in men. In order to avoid admitting that, the constitutional text deploys awkward circumlocutions so that the first appearance of the word slavery in the Constitution appears only in the 13th Amendment, abolishing the institution. The Neo-Lincolnians, on the other hand, also overshoot. The founders more easily accepted slavery supporting provisions like the Fugitive Slave Clause than they needed to. Nobody threatened to leave the Union if that clause had not been included. It is true that the delegates, the delegates accepted several clauses recognizing and in some degree furthering that institution. But probably most significant, and not always mentioned by the Neo-Garrisonians, most significant was the dog that didn't bark. Nobody stood up, nobody, nobody stood up to demand that the Constitution contain provisions prohibiting or that Congress be empowered to prohibit slavery in the states. The Neo-Lincolnians are surely correct to note a lot of distaste, even repugnance for slavery at the convention, but their case for concessions under duress is not, as some of the neo-Garrisonians show, entirely compelling. Now, so as a first step towards understanding the meaning of the slavery provisions in the Constitution, we need to ascend, I think, to a somewhat more general level than the specific constitutional clauses I've mentioned, and instead take our bearings from the two largest facts about slavery in the Constitution. First, the aforementioned failure even to contemplate a power in the United States government to deal with slavery in the states. And the other aforementioned fact that the words slavery and slave nowhere appear, but are replaced with these awkward workarounds. The existence of slavery, it seems, was accepted, but not endorsed. It was accepted as an institution of the states that chose to have it as the specific constitutional clauses dealing with it made clear. The Fugitive Slave Clause very carefully and deliberately described the slaves as, quote, persons, persons held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof. Stephen Douglas, the man who later debated Lincoln, Stephen Douglas is a good witness to the meaning of the Fugitive Slave Clause. In a speech in 1859, he spoke of the clause in a way that highlights the relationship between slavery and the Constitution. Now, by the express provisions of that clause of the Constitution, a slave, he said, is a person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof, not under the Constitution of the United States, not under the laws of the United States, and by virtue of any federal authority, but rather in a state under the laws thereof. That's Stephen Douglas. 
The slave trade clause spoke of this trade as involving, again, such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit. So the Constitution is very careful not to endorse or make the institution its own. The text does not support Chief Justice Tawney's view in the Dred Scott case that the Constitution explicitly recognizes and affirms slavery, nor does it support the neo-Garrisonian view that it was just a pro-slavery compact. But neither does it declare war on slavery or commit to ending the practice. To understand the constitutional settlement, we need, to look, we need to look at it with the eyes of 1787, not the eyes of 1857 or of 2022. In making the Constitution, the founders were making a federation. That is what the French philosopher Montesquieu called a society of societies. That is to say, a partial union of otherwise independent political units. Establishing the internal ordering of the members was not one of the purposes of such a union. Historian William Wiesek got it right when he said, nearly all the 55 delegates who arrived at Philadelphia in 1787 shared the common assumption that slavery as such had no place in the deliberations there because it was a domestic institution of the states, no different than such things as marriage or ecclesiastical governance, something exclusively within the responsibility of the states. That in itself made the largest fact about the constitutional settlement regarding slavery nearly inevitable. That is to say, the failure of the Constitution to say or do anything about slavery in the states. Moreover, the new Constitution was not a mere reprise, repeat of traditional federalism. The Americans, under the leadership of James Madison, that great man, revolutionized the principles of federal design by relating the government of the Union directly to its individual human citizens, as all of you who have taken intro to American government, I'm sure, have learned and not merely to its member governments, as had been the federal practice in the past. That meant that the government of the Union intruded more deeply, far more deeply, into the internal life of the member states than any historic federation had ever done. A precondition for that unprecedented degree of Union intrusion, however, was a very clear line of demarcation between matters of concern to the government of the Union and matters of concern to the states. The vehicle by which this was accomplished was the enumerated powers in Article I of the Constitution. The general idea behind the enumeration was the idea characteristic of traditional federalism. Matters of government, of governance, I should say, internal to the member states are, with very few exceptions, not matters of concern for the government of the Union, and that included slavery. The American order was innovative also in committing itself to a republicanism that reinforced this commitment to internal semi-autonomy of the states. Republicanism means, at a minimum, self-government. Each unit should be a self-governing entity which means that in matters concerning itself, other political units should not be making decisions for it. Thus, the commitments to federal union and to republicanism converged to guarantee that matters like slavery would be regarded as state institutions, largely outside the purview of the government of the union and its constitution. Nonetheless, nonetheless, there is, a, there is an important nonetheless here. Nonetheless, slavery was not in fact left merely as an internal matter for the member states. In at least those three places in the Constitution, national account was taken of the institution. Slavery may be a state institution, but there were some matters 
where it necessarily spilled over into the Union, and constitutional provision of some sort had to be made for it. That provision, that constitutional provision, was more readily forthcoming than the neo-Lincolnians admit, but less pro-slavery than the neo-Garrisonians assert. Take, for example, the Fugitive Slave Clause. This clause provided that a slave escaping into another state shall not become free by virtue of being in a free territory. To have the kind of union the Americans sought, a huge free trade area, meant having open borders between the states and therefore a porousness that makes slave escape much easier than it might otherwise be. In a federation, one should attempt to avoid, so far as possible, obvious sources of friction between the member states. If slaves could escape with relative ease into free states across open borders, then there surely would be frictions among the states. So the convention had no difficulty accommodating the slave states on this matter of fugitives. The Fugitive Slave Clause is not then a constitutional endorsement of slavery beyond the already noted principle that the existing state republics uh, within the Union were to order themselves internally, including keeping slavery they already had if they wished to. The Fugitive Slave Clause's drafters went far out of their way to emphasize slavery as a state institution under state law and the accommodation to it as a matter of comedy or of good relations among the states. It was not to repeat a constitutional endorsement of slavery, but contrary to the thrust of neo-Lincolnian thinking, the clause did represent a degree of toleration toward the institution. And if you're interested, I can speak in the Q&A period of the other spillover uh, clauses in the Constitution. So the Constitution accepts slavery as a fact characterizing some of the member units and makes an accommodation to that fact so far as there are spillover effects that can't be avoided in the Union itself. It is at most, at most, a stance of neutrality toward the institution that some members had but others did not. The other crucial fact, the unwillingness even to speak the name of the practice and to make sure that it is identified entirely as an institution of the states practicing it, that points to a distinct lack of neutrality. If the Constitution were truly neutral or supportive towards slavery, it would show no hesitation to naming the institution. Consider the Constitution of the Confederate States of America. It showed no shyness about speaking openly of the peculiar institution by its proper name. Indeed, it prohibited any of the members from abolishing slavery. That's what a real pro-Constitution looks like. Moreover, the constitutional provisions regarding slavery must be viewed against the backdrop of so much of the rest of the political climate of that day. The colonies, acting together to declare their independence, had expressed a theory of legitimacy which nearly all members of that generation understood to be contrary to the institution of slavery. Thus, William Wiesick, who I quoted earlier, speaks of the widespread and heartfelt opposition to slavery expressed by so many of the framers. He endorses as doubtless correct the tendency of the neo-Lincolnian historians to ascribe anti-slavery sentiment to most of the founders. Nearly all the new states adopted constitutions reaffirming those same principles of legitimacy. During the founding era, many of the new states acted on the perceived incompatibility between the received principles of legitimacy and slavery. And they moved to abolish the practice in the states that did not do so. I'm not sure I'd include South Carolina in this. There were strong currents of sentiment to follow the examples of the others. Virginia, very strong example. Where slavery was retained, the most common defense was the plea of necessity, not the plea that slavery was inherently right or legitimate. 
Now, I rehearse these familiar facts in order to propose a formula for the place of slavery in the Constitution that is neither neo-Garrisonian nor neo-Lincolnian. Within the constitutional order, slavery was legal, but not legitimate. It was legal within the member states and to a degree within the constitution itself, where it spilled over, as I said, and impinged on the union. It was not legitimate because the founding generation accepted a theory of political right as expressed in the Declaration of Independence and very related in many, many related documents that was incompatible, that was incompatible with slavery. But the principle of legitimacy they accepted did not penetrate or inform the entire political system. It was in this sense an incomplete constitution. It is not that the constitution gave no aid to slavery as an institution, but nothing the constitutional framers did was incompatible with the hope, which the neo-Lincolnians do see, that the institution would ultimately pass away. But they didn't provide a way to make that hope come to be. My point is a relatively narrow, but I think of some importance. The Constitution did indeed, did indeed give slavery a place in the established legality, but the institution remained outside the broader consensus on the basic principles of legitimacy upon which the Constitution was erected. Now, it is problematic for any political legal system to live with this kind of disparity between its legality and its legitimacy. Any political community experiencing such a disparity is subject to great pressures to bring legitimacy and legality into greater harmony with each other. As Lincoln said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. The antebellum period was deeply marked by the tensions resulting from this disparity between legitimacy and legality. And over time, that disparity proved more and more difficult to live with. Now, three kinds of responses arose during the antebellum era, and as they interacted with each other, the rift became ever greater and more intense. One response was to attempt to remake legality so as to cohere with legitimacy, undo the legality. <clears throat> Such was the approach of the various sorts of abolitionists. They would do away with slavery, which was incompatible with legitimacy. A second response was to remake legitimacy to match the otherwise anomalous legality of slavery. Such were the efforts of a man whose name I think is well known on this campus, John C. Calhoun and Alexander Stevens, the entire slavery as a positive good school, the entire school who would in effect deny the truth of the Declaration of Independence. Finally, there were efforts to creatively maintain the tension so as to preserve the original defective and incomplete but established constitutional order. And Supreme Court Justices Joseph Story and Benjamin Curtis, not household names anymore, uh, were two who tried that particular path. Now the strain caused by the diremption between legality and legitimacy, of course, proved too great for the political system to weather. The result was the Civil War, which in theory settled the question in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Now, as I said earlier, the Constitution, as it left the hands of its framers, was drastically incomplete, largely because of its character as a federal constitution. The Reconstruction Amendments were understood by its framers to achieve the completion of the Constitution by producing a political arrangement in which legitimacy and legality finally converged. That convergence involved or even required a much more forceful break 
with federal principle than even the original Constitution did. All it took to free the Constitution from its entanglement with slavery was the application of the legitimacy principles as expressed in the Declaration of Independence to apply those to the states. But we must note in closing that completing the Constitution was not in itself sufficient to overcome the legacy of slavery, showing once again that the Constitution was not the main issue in planting or fostering slavery in America. The Constitution was thus neither a covenant with hell nor a bulwark against slavery. It was admittedly an imperfect but not an evil thing. It was, we can say, what it had to be, given the task of Constitution making as its makers could only conceive it and the mark that history had already made on the continent. I thank you. I'll be happy uh, to uh, uh, answer any questions uh, so far as I'm able. And uh, I, uh, I'll just call on people as they make their questions known. Could have played a role in the. And abolishing. Oh, and abolishing from the beginning. Yes, yes, yes. And it didn't do that. It makes sense based on the context. But I wonder if you had any more thoughts on more of that. Is it still? Is that still problematic for the foundation based on the fact that it kind of took this bystander step back as opposed to directly taking action? Well, you know, in in a way, what I want to say is that um, slavery. So let, let, me re, let, let me review the, the point you, that you kind of summarized, which is I, I did make the claim that they didn't do anything about abolishing slavery in the original Constitution. And I wanted to make the case that given the mental framework that they were working with, which was a framework not about slavery, but a framework about federalism, it was a framework about how to put together this kind of Constitution that they were trying to make. I don't want to say nobody, but almost nobody on the entire North American continent wanted a, what they would call a, cons a consolidation. That is a, a, a kind of government in which the federal union, the government of the union, the government of the United States, would have powers to just govern in general the whole country. No, nobody wanted that. They, they didn't even think of it as a possibility. It, it would have been I mean, one of the, I mean, we could go into details. Maybe some of you have studied this in your political science courses. They were very committed also to the idea of forming a republic. And the idea of forming a republic over the huge territory that America was even then, when it was just these 13 states along the eastern seaboard, um, that was just beyond their uh, imagination. This was not possible. They didn't see how it could happen. And so, uh, the idea of, you know, it, it can, a partial union is possible, but not, not this kind of union where, where this one government rules it all. So that was just beyond thinking of for, for them. So, so I want to say the Constitution was not what um, Garrison and some of the others want to say, or what 1619 Project wants to say, inspired by racism. It wasn't inspired by racism. It did leave the possibility of racism find expression in some of the places where it did find expression, but, by, but we also have to recognize that um, the abolition of slavery was occurring in the North uh, all this time. And if you look at the, uh, some of the political writings of, the, you know, of Madison, of Jefferson, and so on, they were themselves extremely interested in trying to move in that same direction. It just proved to be very, very difficult. Where slavery was more established was, you know, what was a much larger institution than it was where they were able to be rid of it. Um, okay, so, so there's that. So, but your, your question is, well, is, are there lingering, lingering effects 
So I want to say on the one side, no, the Constitution is clean of it. The Constitution is clean of it, and is now, after the, four, after the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments. Those were wonderful, it was a wonderful thing they did in making those amendments. Uh, but the legacy of slavery is still with us. And I mean, partly I want to say, well, that's, you know, that's not really the Constitution's doing. That's, that was a doing partly of the fact that slavery existed for, since 1619 until 17, 87 when we made the Constitution, that's how long? 170 years or something, almost 170 years. Uh, you know, it had a long time to get settled in, in this country. And so the Constitution isn't the issue. The principles of the revolution aren't the issue. The, how should we say, the nature of the regime as, as it aspires to be is not the issue, at least so I would argue. Um, but I, I also wouldn't want to say, well, I mean, the, the founders, or at least many of them, were not with, you know, they were not without, they, they were not without sin. I mean, there, there, there was an issue there for them. Okay. Uh, does that, I hope, respond to your question? Yes, good. It was a long answer to a short question, but <clears throat> somebody ask a long question, I'll give a short answer. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time. That's a good. That, that's a good question, um, and I, I tried to address it in my talk, but I passed it over fairly quickly. So let me just repeat the point: the Constitution, when it was established, was incomplete, in the sense that there was a principle of legitimacy that was dominant in the in the country, but did, was not dominant in the Constitution, or at least not dominate the whole thing, and that was because it was a federal constitution, and so they were not able to impose that principle of legitimacy throughout. That is, to make the Constitution complete. And so when I say that the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments completed the Constitution, they, what, what they did is they said no, no slavery in any of the states, uh, and you know all the things the 14th Amendment protects, the equal protection of the laws, due process of law, for every individual that the state deals with. So we're no longer leaving the states free to just you know, handle affairs on their own we're really intruding much more. And, but what we're intruding to do is to impose the standards of legitimacy of the regime on them. So we've completed in the sense now that we've made effective the principles of legitimacy. And so legality and legitimacy come together. And that, that's, the, that, that's the issue. Yes, uh, sure. You had mentioned that as a federation, uh, so you have internal states governed by a federal government. Yeah. Uh, to me, that doesn't square with what I understand are the supremacy clause uh -huh. and some other things that are written into the Constitution uh -huh. that clearly gives okay. the federal government or a majority in Congress the authority to work its will over over the states, should something be uh, contested? So I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because it, it seems to me that you're giving a little too much uh, credence to the confederal, confederacy argument okay. in terms of the United States being confederacy first and the federal. Gotcha. So uh, I don't, are people in the back able to hear the question? Should I try to restate it? Please. Yes. Uh, the question has to do with whether I have not overstated the federal dimension of the Constitution in my attempt to explain how slavery stood in it. Um, uh, because uh, as a counterexample, this gentleman mentions um, the supremacy clause. And I don't know, is that familiar to everybody in the crowd? No, okay, so part of the Constitution says that uh, laws of, con laws, uh, sorry, the Constitution, laws of Congress and treaties made by the the government of the United States uh, 
shall be supreme law of the land over the state, and, and anything in the state constitution or laws to the contrary notwithstanding. So that means there's a kind of a power in the federal government to trump state laws and constitutions. Is that a fair restatement? Yeah, okay. So I, I would say that the supremacy clause though, yes, it's an important part of the constitution, but it's not an all purpose, it's not a grant of all purpose power. That's, it, it implicitly is saying those things that the federal constitution requires or those things that Congress does must be valid under the limited powers that Congress has. In those areas where Congress is given the power, it trumps. But it doesn't trump just generally. And so slavery would be one of those examples where Congress just had no power to deal with that institution. Well, then why did, so the Constitution bans the, um, the abolition of slavery through a certain date, right? And it also- No, uh, abolition of the slave trade, yeah. Not the abolition, but the, the deportation so it recognizes that Congress can legislate, and it also recognizes that Congress can legislate on, on trade, interstate trade yeah. and international uh -huh. trade. Right. So aren't there contradictions there where if, if Yeah. Okay, so uh, l l l I mean, I think you're mixing up two things, two parts of the Constitution, though, that we, we want to keep sure. straight. Yeah. So yeah, the, the Constitution, there, there's the... Um, interstate, sla the slave trade clause. That's what, that's what I think what we're talking about. So the slave trade clause provides that Congress may not uh, um, prevent the entry of such persons as states want to have enter, that, which is one of those odd circumlocutions for meaning the slaves. Congress may not prevent the slave trade, let's call it. Congress may not prevent the slave trade until the year 1808, 20 years from when the Constitution would come into effect. Okay, so this, the free state, the states, and I have to say here in South Carolina, South Carolina was one of the two states that was insistent on that, on that provision, South Carolina and Georgia. They said, we need to import more slaves, and this was a concession made to their demands. So come 1808, in fact, come 1807, before 1808, Thomas Jefferson, a man of Virginia, a slaveholder himself, provide or push through Congress a law abolishing the slave trade at the very first moment it was possible. On you know, 12 a.m. January 1st, 1808, that law went into effect. So that's the power that Congress had to deal with the slave trade. And it could have, yes, because Congress is given, more generally, Congress is given the power to regulate both commerce among the states and commerce with foreign nations. And the slave trade is part of commerce with foreign nations. And this is one of the areas where slavery necessarily uh, uh, spilled over into the powers of the federal government because it had this power over international trade. Um, uh, and so that is one place where, yes, definitely a concession is made to slavery. Um, but Congress does not have the power uh, to, uh, get, uh, Congress is not given the power to abolish slavery at some certain date. The only thing it can abolish is the slave trade. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. How did the Articles of Confederation deal with the issue of slavery? And did they learn anything? It leaves, uh, actually, it leaves slavery even more sort of undefined than, uh, but partly because the Articles of Confederation didn't even have these spillover areas because the three spillover areas are areas of, well, one, the power over foreign commerce, which the articles did not have. Two, I guess conceivably the, the, uh, the um, uh, Fugitive Slave Clause could have applied, but they didn't, think, they didn't think about that at that time. And then third, the other provision has to, the three, so-called Three-Fifths Clause, where uh, representation in Congress is determined by population. Okay, and then the question becomes, so how do, you count, how do you count the enslaved people? Do they count as, they're not going to be voting, the enslaved people, they're not going to be, vo they're not going to be voting for sure, but how, so how should, they, how should they be counted for representation purposes? And so that was one of the, another area where they had to figure out some way to deal with that. There was, it was forced on them. Uh, 
Okay. And so the Articles of Confederation, since it didn't elect people like that, uh, had no, it didn't have that, didn't have, didn't have that issue. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier when answering the question that the Constitution is clear all slavery now is achieved. I'm sorry. I'm, I, you sorry. mentioned earlier when you were answering this question that the Constitution is now clear of slavery and it's not a Declaration of Independence. Yeah. What would your thoughts be on the 13th, 13th Amendment's exception to slavery as punishment for crime? Oh. It becomes an issue later on with mass incarceration, which allows now people to own other people. Yeah. It's essentially allowed to own other people. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I, I mean, certainly they didn't anticipate it being used that way. And whether, I mean, I, 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 I'm not sure. Do you, do you think that that exception of the 13th Amendment is what is what's behind mass incarceration? Not at the time. It's not, not necessarily today. It was at the time. At the time, but I don't think they use, did they use it that way. And uh, I mean, the language of the language of the 13th Amendment is taken over directly from the Northwest Ordinance. Uh, which was passed even before the Constitution was adopted and then repassed when the Constitution was adopted. Uh, Jefferson wrote it. It was understood to be a simply an, an, an anti-slavery uh, statement. And, I, you know, they did do, they did make, you know, like chain gangs, they made the convicts go out and work. And that was partly, uh, well, I, you know, I, I don't want to go into, I don't even know that much about their, Penology, what they thought about, you know, punishment and all of that. But um, clearly, they thought it was a legitimate, it was a legitimate thing, to make the prisoners, in effect, support them, you know, support themselves. They would contribute to their own ec economic up upkeep. I think that was the idea. It perhaps got pervert, has been used for perverted reasons um, since then. Yeah. Is that? Um, yeah. Okay. There was. Uh, I guess there was the two of you. Yeah. Anybody else? Good. Um, is it possible to read uh, that awkward sentence that you just read as something more than neutral, as something like a lifeline back to legitimacy, but there'd be no back to legitimacy? So yeah. Back to legitimacy? Yes. About the recognition of very, yeah. I, I didn't comment on that, but I think it's very important. The slaves are referred to as persons. Person was the term used for a human being with legal that with uh, receives legal recognition, and so that's really important that they're you, you know despite this dehumanizing way in which slaves are being used as slaves, nonetheless they're still identified as persons. And notice that James Madison in that quotation that I read, he said, "We don't want to admit that persons that human beings can ever be property." Um, and that, I think that, that per, use of per, the word person is a kind of dig at that very, you know, and it kind of makes that point right there. You know, in the same moment, it's almost, it's sort of denying it, but um, it, it's, a, it's a sort of criticism of the institution right there, I think. Yeah. Good. That, that was a, that's a good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's you know I mean those kind of questions are unanswerable. Um, I, you know somebody rose up actually around 1820. You know 1820 is a big breaking point in the history of slavery in America because 1820 was the year of the Missouri Compromise and some of you may in your history courses have studied the Missouri Compromise, but the question arose. So when the country was expanding and Missouri, uh, which was part of the Louisiana Purchase Territory, Missouri had already had slavery within it and wanted to come into the Union as a slave state. And there was a tremendous amount of resistance to their doing that. Um, and eventually a deal was kind of worked out where Missouri was admitted as a slave state and then 
Maine was kind of shucked off from Massachusetts and admitted as a free state. So the, state, the free and slave states remained equal in number, which was important at that time because of the Senate. So each state has equal representation in the Senate. So they tried to keep, they tried to keep the number of states equal. Um, at that time, Jefferson, Madison, other astute people said, I mean, Jefferson said, this debate, this conflict about the admission of Missouri was a fire bell in the night. That is, it was a sign of a crisis that's coming. And so maybe that's the first moment they realized this was really going to be like explosive. Uh, and so let's say Jefferson had had that thought in 1787 instead of in 1820. Yeah, what if he had said that? Here's what I think what would have happened. There wouldn't have been a union. I, I, I just don't think there was any way that a union that could be, could be made that would somehow really deal with the slavery question in a way that was going to avow, avoid the, the problem. That, that's, what, that's my best guess on that one. Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> There's one reason I would give is that political opinions are always more simple-minded than the reality that they're about. Okay, I mean that's just one fact about almost all political opinions about almost any question. Um, I mean, you know, opinions that are spread around in the society. Um, our, you know, our opinion. Obviously, I don't want to say obviously nothing is obvious in this matter, but the civil rights movement made a big difference. The civil rights made, movement made a big difference in this issue where people were rightfully concerned about the race question in America and trying to do something about it and seeing that the legality on the ground didn't entirely deal well, deal well with it. I mean, I, I kind of overstated. The 14th Amendment, in fact, allowed the continuation of, a, of a, the Jim Crow system, so it wasn't really quite, we hadn't quite gotten as far as I suggested we did. I'd say the Constitution was completed only really with the time of the Civil Rights Movement with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act. But to leave that complication aside, so I think you know, people then look back at the past with the issues of the present in their mind and they reinterpret the past to somehow tell us a story that, or a narrative that they find satisfyingly explanatory for the problem of the present. And that, that happens like regularly and I think the 1619 project that we that I mentioned at the beginning is another example of that, um, and I think some of the uh, stuff on the other side is likewise an example of that. Uh, so, yeah, way in the back there, oh, who's that guy? History has a way of making strange bedfellows. I mean, what, what, what would you make of it? <laughs> 
Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I would attribute some of these, these statements at this moment especially to Lincoln's desire, you know, uh, as expressed in the second inaugural, to bring the country together to overcome the, 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 the factionalism that had prevailed before the war. So he's very generously giving um, uh, Garrison a lot of the emancipation, the uh, abolitionists a lot of credit. And I think he felt they, they did deserve some credit because they got the country kind of stirred up a bit. That, no, no, no question. Um, and Garrison, maybe, <laughs> how should we say, out of character, uh, was being generous, <laughs> being generous back but towards Lincoln if, with the same goal, that is to kind of make, overcome polarization, you know, uh, uh, this whole thing, polarization, that we now suffer from. Um, because, but I think Lincoln's position on the abolitionists was actually a little more complicated than that uh, at, while it was all going on. He saw, he said in, um, in an important statement that he made early, very early in his career when he was still just, just a uh, delegate to the Illinois legislature, um, he objected to a uh, resolution that the Illinois legislature had made. Um, uh, uh, um, it, it did two things. One, it objected to abolitionism, and two, it affirmed the rights of the Southerners to main, keep their slaves if they wanted to. And L Lincoln and one other person in the legislature issued a protest against this uh, 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 proposal or resolution made by the legislature. And in his resolution, he said, slavery is both unjust and bad. It's bad policy and it's unjust, those two things. So that, you know, bad th it's a bad thing altogether. But he said, but, the, but the, abolition, the preaching of abolitionism makes things worse rather than better. So I think that was his thought through a good part of his career because the abolitionists, on the one hand, uh, I mean, one of the things the abolitionists did is that they, um, as we might say, they put the fear of God in the slaveholders. That is, the slaveholders feared that the abolitionist sentiment was going to lead to slave uprisings. Lincoln didn't believe that that was actually likely, that there would be slave uprisings, but he did, he did believe that the southern slaveholders were very sensitive to abolitionist preaching, and that made them worse as slaveholders, made them hold, hold on to it with more firmness and uh, more commitment. Uh, and turn them against all attempts to ameliorate the issue, deal with it somehow. So I think, I mean, that's a great, that's a great, uh, a great Lincolnian move, you know, like making peace with everybody. But, but I think his, at the time, his, his conceptions were a little more complicated. Yeah, Beth. Well, you know, I mean, I guess I would agree that they're right. There's an, there is a narrative of oppression and oppressor, uh, uh, of oppressed and oppressor here. There is that narrative. I just would, I want to free the Constitution from being a significant part of that, of, the, of, that nar of that narrative. And it seems to me that that narrative can be maintained even while giving my version of what the Constitution was actually doing with regard to slavery. And I'll just make a pitch. I have an article coming out in the journal called um, uh, National Affairs. It'll be coming out sometime this month, actually, in which I try to make this ca uh, make the very case that you're asking for. So, if you want to uh, get my views on it, that's where you'll find them. Yeah, uh, it doesn't cost much. We have time for one more question. Oh, okay, one more question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, that was a very unfortunate, uh, very unfortunate moment, uh, in my opinion, in American history. This is the uh, 1876 election when there was a big battle. Who actually won the election? <laughs> and um, the Republicans, who Lincoln's the party of Lincoln, had been in power from the time of Lincoln until then, and had been in charge of Reconstruction. And Reconstruction, as you may know, was very disliked in the South. And it was, in many ways, a harsh. It was, there were many harsh features to it. There was a military, a strong military presence, for example. And so a deal was made in 1876 that Reconstruction would, in effect, be brought to an end. Military in, uh, 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 involvement in the South would be curtailed. And the South would, in effect, be allowed to proceed on its own how it, on how it would deal with the race issue. Uh, and so that one, uh, and, but the, then the Republican candidate got appointed, <laughs> was appointed president. So that was the deal. The Republicans got the presidency, and the, the Democrats got, who were ma mainly in the South, got the end of Reconstruction. So a trade off of sorts. How did the Constitution allow this? I mean, it shouldn't have. I mean, I guess that's the, that's the answer I would give. Um, maybe it had something to do with the way the 14th Amendment, I mean, if, we, if, this were, if we had more time, I, I would give a more complex account of the 14th Amendment. But let, let me just say, the 14th Amendment was written in such a way as to say, no state shall deprive persons of X, Y, and Z. Okay, no state shall do that. It does not give Congress direct power to provide for the provision of those good things, of good things. It just says the states can't, can't deprive people of those good things. Um, and so the 14th Amendment could have been written in a more forceful way, in a yet more forceful way in which the states would not have been given as much leeway as the way the 14th Amendment was written allowed them uh, so that would be, I mean, that would be one possibility. I mean, that'd be one possibility to, you know, to deal with that. So again, I'm, I'm forced to withdraw a little bit of what I said. The 14th Amendment doesn't really quite complete the Constitution. It's a good down payment on completing it, but there's still some stuff that, could, that needs to be done, some of which was done, as I said, at the time of the Civil Rights Movement, which really made up for that. Yeah, I guess that was it. Last question. We've done it. Thank you.